I'm Ken Lieberthal, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. I'm here with four of my colleagues, two in Washington and two in Beijing, uh, to discuss the recent developments at the National People's Congress in Beijing. Let me first welcome my colleagues. Sitting directly to my left, Jonathan Pollack, uh, who is uh, Director of the John L. Thornton China Center at Brookings. Good morning. Good morning, Ken. Uh, then Chung Lee, uh, who's Senior Fellow and Director of Research at the John L. Thornton China Center uh, in uh, at Brookings. Chung, welcome. Good morning. Uh, in Beijing, I should say good evening uh, to Wang Feng, who is director of the Brookings Tsinghua Center uh, in Beijing. Uh, Wang Feng, good evening. Good yes, evening. good evening and good morning, Ken. <laughs> Thank you. And also Tao Ran, who is a non-resident senior fellow of Brookings, affiliated with the Brookings Tsinghua Center in Beijing. Tao Ran, welcome. Uh, hi, Ken. Good to be here. Uh, delighted to have you. Uh, we're here to discuss the National People's Congress, which uh, convened uh, just a few days ago, or complete, concluded just a few days ago in Beijing. Uh, as you know, they, there is a, the National People's Congress is the legislature uh, for China. Uh, a new National People, People's Congress is chosen every five years, but every ten years, that new Congress is the occasion for major change in government personnel. Uh, select a new president uh, for the country, a new prime minister, and uh, major changes in government officials at the cabinet level. Uh, that also is the occasion for a review of recent work of the government, a look ahead in terms of government priorities, and it concludes with a press conference uh, by the newly chosen uh, premier. Uh, so we've had all of that uh, just in the last few days from Beijing, and we'd like to discuss here, uh, what are the takeaways from that? What have we really learned from this National People's Congress? Let me see whether I can have each of you spend just a couple of minutes giving me what you think are the kind of key takeaways that we should have uh, from this recent meeting. And let's begin with Wang Feng in Beijing. Uh, this Congress talked a lot about the role of the Chinese government going forward and how that might change. Could you give us your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, the uh, issue of legitimacy is very clear in the minds of the new leadership uh, in Beijing. Um, the government that just came uh, into uh, power, well, into uh, transition, made it very clear that uh, it wants to connect with the population with society, and specifically there are three uh, very clear messages they wanted to convey. The first is the rule by law and especially by constitution. So uh, all three top leaders, the president, the president of the People's Congress, and the new prime minister uh, made it very clear that they will run uh, rule the country by constitution. So that's number one. Uh, number two, they also started, this is before even the National People's Congress, to streamline the government and, and to in increase uh, the efficiency of the uh, government, starting by cutting the waste uh, within uh, the government. So Li Keqiang made it very clear they would want to uh, control the size of the government, government spending, and uh, so on and so forth. And then third is uh, the at least the, uh, the statement that the government would withdraw in some areas from uh, spheres where market can function. So uh, that is uh, the third kind of message. So combined, I think the government really wants to reconnect with the population and wants to uh, reaffirm its uh, uh, legitimacy, it's based on the support of uh, the public. Terrific. Thank you very much. It sounds like a very ambitious agenda in that sphere. Uh, Lee Chung, uh, can you give us some sense of whether the new leadership that was chosen is likely to be able to move this agenda forward effectively? What kind of folks are these? Well, new leadership often means new policy. In Beijing, probably more so in Washington, personnel is policy. Now, uh, this team of leadership is not famous for you know, political reform, but uh, except for probably the area of the constitutional development, the rule of law, because they think that's a safe zone. I agree with Wang Feng what he said. 
Xi Jinping even said that the placing power in the cage of regulations talk about importance of constitution. But besides that, there's not so much discussion about the political reform. Now, in spite of this, or because of their weaknesses in political reform, they probably want to get you know, political capital through economic policy. The good news is this team is a very solid in terms of economic reform. They are economic reformers, most of these leaders. They are also well experienced in terms of managing major cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin, Shenzhen, and Guangdong, and etc. So uh, uh, they are ready to uh, make the change. Now this is all under the broad framework, what Xi Jinping called China dream, which is a middle class dream, but also that, uh, that gives them opportunity to invest. So because they are well positioned, they actually have better control over the state of monopolized uh, uh, industries. So this is just like Nixon goes to Beijing, you know. So they probably were more capable to deal with the, the Guo Jingming to the state progress at the private sector retreat. So therefore, really give the market uh, a chance to accelerate financial liberalization, provide small uh, uh, loans for small and medium-sized private sector. Now these are things we are going to. Uh, see whether they can deliver. Now, ultimately, economic reform probably related with political reform, but they may take some some time. And uh, but uh, Xi Jinping entered his honeymoon period, so all the signs seem to be very very good at the moment. Uh, terrific, thank you. Now, one of the factors that they're playing with as they try to uh, keep the Chinese economy moving ahead rapidly as conditions change uh, is the promotion of urbanization. Urbanization has already been proceeding like a tsunami in China for almost 20 years, uh, but they seem to have something uh, somewhat different in mind as they go forward. Tauron, you're a specialist on that area. Uh, can you give us some sense of what you took away from the National People's Congress in terms of plans for rapid urbanization, which were mentioned repeatedly during the course of this meeting? Okay. Um, yes, I think actually Ke Qiang's emphasize on urbanization has been around for some time and um, his idea is that you know China is too heavily dependent on export so now it's time to you know really settle down this 200 million migrant workers in cities on a permanent base so that they can you know earn more consume more and that will boost the you know economic growth in the future you know uh, for the next decade uh, or two decades to come. Um, I think that's actually the right uh, uh, direction to go, uh, but the key issue is, is still, you know, um, you know, you have to change the development model to really make this happen. You have to undertake some major reforms in land, in public finance system, and in a household registration system to make this ha all this happening, to, to you know, change uh, your path of you know development, they all realize that the existing development model is not sustainable. Um, so we need to <coughs> have a new model. But for new model to come, you know, rural reform need to be in place. And uh, I'm I, I think they know about that. But so whether they have figured out the right way to do the reform, uh, you know, it's still in question. Okay, thank you. In other words, the goals are clear, but the means are going to be complicated and difficult. Uh, let me turn to one major area we haven't touched on yet, which is foreign policy. And Jonathan, can you give us some sense of your read of what the rest of the world uh, should expect in terms of Chinese policy going forward? Uh, Ken, what struck me about the uh, comments on foreign policy uh, at the Congress uh, is that uh, unlike the all these areas we've already been talking about where there is an ambitious potentially very wide-ranging agenda on changes in economic policy, changes in social policy. Most of the themes on foreign policy were to reiterate existing policy directions, uh, an emphasis on peaceful development, uh, an insistence, of course, that uh, China's interests had to be respected, uh, the pursuit, uh, hopefully, of a stable U.S.-China relations, references to wanting not to see turbulence uh, in China's immediate regional environment. But having said that, I think we see in the comments from uh, both um, uh, Yang, Je Yang Jiechi in his farewell address as foreign minister before he became state counselor, and to some extent in the comments of uh, Xi Jinping himself, is a more forceful 
direction uh, in foreign policy uh, in the sense that China's interests must be respected, uh, China will act accordingly, it will continue to increase its military development and so forth. Uh, the other thing that did strike me very, very much in, in the comments was a particularly sharp line on Japan. No give uh, in terms of the tensions between China and Japan, uh, insistence that all, all correct policies are on China's side, and it's really going to be incumbent on Japan to shift its policy goals if we're going to sustain a, a stable environment. So to me, this indicates that China, the leadership does feel, despite all the uncertainties at home, uh, that they have the wherewithal and the means to push a whole set of policies uh, in the immediate regional environment to protect China's larger interests. Uh, what are the implications of that for U.S. relations with China, given that most of the countries China is having trouble with are either uh, allies or partners of the United States? Uh, no dots were connected here. Uh, and uh, I, it is clear that, in a way, what China is trying to do is, on the one hand, protect its immediate regional interests, but not to see the relationship with the United States suffer under the circumstances. And that's going to be a very, very tricky phenomenon because American interests are deeply engaged in maintaining a stable and peaceful region. Uh, so um, I think we really need to look upon this as a, as a transition point in foreign policy in the sense that I can imagine certain kinds of changes under the new foreign policy team, but they were not yet spelled out. Um, this, is, uh, this is the road ahead that I think, frankly, the United States and China are going to have to grapple with in a major way in the, in the months and years to come. So overall, this Congress, as most such meetings, articulated a set of goals and directions, uh, tried to create a kind of political image of, for the new leadership, uh, but was short on details about how we get from here to there. And it, the devil is in the details. Let, let me just raise, before we go into a discussion of these issues, one more point that uh, played a prominent role in the Congress and I think we should have on the table too. And that's the issue of environmental remediation. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought to, a, uh, to an extraordinary extent uh, the issue of environmental deterioration, in fact environmental devastation, uh, was a theme throughout this meeting. And the Chinese have promised going forward that they will create what they term an ecological civilization. Basically that the government owes the people a clean and healthy environment uh, in addition to economic growth and the higher standard of living in other terms. Mm -hmm. uh, that to my mind relates to everything that's been said here today because it requires a change in the fundamental development model uh, if they're going to be able to achieve that. Uh, having said that, let me uh, go back to a couple of the issues that were raised and just uh, ask for some further comment. And please, among the four of you, uh, feel free to come in uh, uh, wherever you wish in commenting, but I'll start off in each instance uh, referring to one person in particular. Uh, Wang Feng, you uh, particularly stressed their uh, strong comments uh, focused on increasing rule of law and increasingly abiding by the Constitution. Uh, China has not been a country that in most Western eyes has paid a great deal of attention to either rule of law or the Constitution. Uh, a, how big a change is this, and B, how real is it uh, to your mind? Are we seeing a really fundamental uh, uh, new way of doing things in, in the near-term future, or is this a long-term aspiration to meet popular demands but is unlikely to make much of a difference in the realities of China? Uh, well, uh, as uh, Tao Ran uh, commented earlier on, um, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, big statements uh, but so far, uh, the details are not all here, with one exception. In the press conference uh, given by uh, the new Prime Minister Li Keqiang, uh, he did uh, reveal that a much uh, debated and criticized uh, practice, this is the uh, labor reform uh, camp system, and uh, that particular practice, uh, which is basically uh, holding people up without going through a trial, and that system uh, will be reformed and then the, uh, the result will be out before the end of the year. So that's one, at least, concrete uh, example of showing that they are really thinking about, not just talking about this, uh, but at least would uh, have some actions to show. 
but would you expect, for example, uh, that in the future we can envision a time where even high-ranking party officials are subject to the rule of law uh, without the party first deciding to toss it to investigate their crimes internally, determine whether there is a serious problem, and only if they decide there's a serious problem and they want to turn them over to the, ju to the judicial system, uh, only under those circumstances can the law touch them as of now. Do you anticipate that that's going to change, or is that just too high a hurdle at this point? Uh, I, I think that's too high a, a hurdle at this point. Uh, the party still, uh, well, they ought to be uh, under the Constitution, under the law, but uh, given, again, this overwhelming uh, priority uh, focusing on the legitimacy on the uh, the survival, uh, the uh, sustains of the government, uh, they are not going to uh, endanger their rule by, I mean, the Communist Party rule by uh, subjecting its own uh, officials to uh, the same law. So, in other words, uh, I would not be surprised that uh, the party is still above the law, at least in this particular area. Remember here, I think even with the uh, the new directions of uh, giving society more uh, power, more say, the bottom line is that uh, the rule of the Communist Party is not going to be challenged. Uh, it is, in fact, notable that both in this meeting and in the 18th Party Congress that uh, convened late last year, uh, one of the key points that was reiterated time and again is that the party must be the sole source of power in China and where the party has fallen short is up to the party itself to reform itself and to uh, improve its quality. So you're taking an organization that has become, as is widely known, corrupt, uh, and in many cases uh, has uh, uh, engaged in actions that create a lot of popular dissatisfaction. Uh, and it has said, we will, we're the ones responsible for cleaning up where we have made mistakes. Uh, others do not have a role to play in this that is uh, strong. Uh, I guess my question, Chung, you said that uh, political reform is really not to be expected anytime soon. The key focus here will be on economic reform. Right? Uh, but the current model of, uh, of economic development has engagement by the state, uh, enterprise by enterprise across this economy, both public and private, both state-owned enterprises and private enterprises, uh, local officials uh, pick enterprises and in many ways determine the degree that, to which they'll be successful through subsidies and licenses and exemptions from regulations and so forth. Now, one issue that was raised at this Congress was separation of party, uh, or separation of the government from enterprises. Uh, that goes way back to the 1980s as, a, as an issue. Do you think that kind of major, what would amount to a major political change, uh, is feasible, or uh, does it run too much against the interests of officials in being? Well, it, uh, we do need to uh, understand Chinese leadership face very strong challenge, you know, a daunting challenge, probably never experienced in the past three decades, and uh, except the 1989 Tiananmen, because uh, the rampant uh, corruption, public dis, uh, 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 you know, resentment about uh, official corruption and the monopoly power by uh, the state-owned enterprises. So this is what I said early on. If Communist Party want to survive, they have to surrender some of their power and privilege uh, in order to stay inactive. So, of course, it, it will be hard. And uh, you also see the strong resistance through the bureaucratic restructuring. Uh, originally, the plan wanted to reduce from you know, 27 ministers to like uh, 17 or 18. But end up, you can only change two minutes, uh, uh, about two ministries, you know, and especially the railroad already you know, uh, heavily uh, uh, influenced by the, uh, the corruption scandal of the former minister. So I think uh, you do need to have, uh, they, they face serious battle, but at the same time, for the sake of to survive, they have to make a decision. Now, you are absolutely right that um, the party is a sole institutional player in today's China. But on the other hand, we should not overlook the societal forces, the legal professions, the social media, 
and, uh, and uh, commercial media, they all want to push for change. And then also, the Bo Xilai, the people challenged him actually before the, the scandal, uh, his deputy went to Chengdu counselor. Some legal professions like He Weifang, they uh, you know, openly spoke thought that this is uh, like a dictator-like figure, really violate the constitution, and uh, re in a country without judicial independence, no one's safe. So this kind of argument continue. And also, before Xi Jinping make some of the commitment on constitutional development, actually the legal scholars, legal professions, the whole communities already pushed for all these changes. I think they enter an uh, area that will be more challenges from the society, but the leadership need to respond accordingly. This is similar in my view, like, a, like Taiwan in late 1980s or middle 80s, this kind of dynamic situation. So I think that uh, we will see whether they can really crack down the state monopoly, crack down the corruption. Of course, we should be also idealistic. It will be, take a long time with only partially achievement. But the important thing is where the public will be confident about the, the new leadership. Good. Uh, Tauron, uh, in terms of urbanization, I guess I have two big questions. One is that a lot of the urbanization, probably more than half of the urbanization that's occurred over the last several decades, has been movement of people from rural areas to the large metropolises, seeking work, often in export industries and service sector there and, light, and assembly operations. Uh, it sounds to me like Li Keqiang may have a different model in mind. Like he may be focused more on urbanization in terms of movement of people to smaller cities uh, scattered throughout the country, not nearly as much focused on the East Coast. Uh, and secondly, a big issue in, in uh, this migration to the cities on such a massive scale is what are the opportunities for migrants when they get there? And as of now, migrants in China, with extremely few exceptions, uh, never acquire urban residence rights. They're treated as outsiders, uh, barred from many sectors of the economy, limited in the income that they're able to earn, disadvantaged in, their, in the uh, access their children have to education and so forth. Uh, do you see this system, the, uh, what's called the HUCO system that imposes these limitations, do you see that system being significantly reformed, say, in the coming five years, the period of time of this National People's Congress uh, in office? And also, can you make some comment on the focus of urbanization? It, is the change that I uh, sensed at this meeting real, uh, or is this simply uh, some rhetoric, but likely without much difference on the ground? Uh, OK, Ken, um, thank you for these questions. I think. Um, basically, uh, Li Keqiang did emphasize the development of medium-sized and small cities, uh, also probably you know more in inland area. Uh, but uh, you know, large cities have their have this economy of scale and agglomeration, and uh, the migration actually is from the inland to the coastal area and from the countryside to mainly large and medium-sized cities. So actually, you know, I mean, there, there have been debates on whether, you know, China should allow large cities to further develop. I think the, you know, the reality already gives the answer. You just cannot limit the development of large cities. People come to there because they're good jobs and uh, then, you know, try to accommodate them. Otherwise, you know, if you, you know, uh, force uh, governments in uh, or, or you just cannot force private investments into these small and medium cities, in particular in inland uh, area. Actually, a lot of inland cities are, are trying to do that, but what you know, uh, uh, what they, they got so far is a lot of you know uh, 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 debt that will become non-performing loans in the future. So I think they have to change their mind on this matter if they want to really make it. Uh, as to the hukou system, I think, as I suggested in, you know, uh, uh, earlier, that you have to have land system you know, to be reformed so that the market will provide rental housing, affordable rental housing for so migrant workers. And also the government also need to you know, design, redesign its local tax system and also transfer system to accommodate migrant children. If you don't do this reform, you know, you, I mean, these people, 
you know, cannot have affordable housing and the, and the children cannot have equal access to children's, uh, you know, to urban public education, the reform will not happen. I, I, so far, I haven't seen this happening. I mean, we, we still have time, some time to wait and say. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. So we've only got about two or three minutes left. Uh, it's clear from this discussion that the new Chinese leadership faces an extraordinarily important and complex and high stakes set of issues that they have to navigate uh, in order to maintain their legitimacy and transition to a new and sustainable development model. Uh, that is going to require increasing negotiations, if you will. I use the term loosely with Chinese society, which is now enlivened, empowered by social media and so forth, and with a large middle class that is politically extremely important. Uh, let me conclude by coming back to Jonathan and asking you, Jonathan, with those domestic strains, uh, do you worry about the prospect that the national leadership will feel compelled in foreign policy to take a very tough and nationalistic set of positions in order to gain domestic support by rallying around patriotism. Xi Jinping keeps using the term the China dream. Uh, he identified that very closely with patriotism in recent remarks. Uh, what are the implications? I mean, just what is your sense of what we're going to face in foreign policy growing out of this domestic stew? Yes, I think you've highlighted exactly the thing that is a, a matter, I think, of, ought to be a matter of real, of real concern and real worry, that there is a way in which Xi Jinping is laying out an agenda uh, as he talks about the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, as he talks about patriotism, that he sees a more powerful military, a more active China, as being directly connected with this. He's quite unambiguous about this. We've seen, yet again, uh, a significant increase in the Chinese defense budget. The Chinese, of course, will argue that this is just congruent with the rate of growth as well as inflation. But the trends are clear. He's saying, in effect, if China is to reassert itself, uh, if it is to be respected, it is going to make its presence felt in ways that are frankly different from what we've been accustomed to. And that's going to be part of a very, very big agenda that I think China faces with its neighbors and also China is going to face with the United States in the years to come. So China and the United States have both agreed that we should have a new type of major power relationship, one that uh, manages tensions and builds cooperation. It sounds like that's going to be a very difficult objective to achieve uh, internationally, just as many of these complications domestically are going to be very, very tough. Absolutely. Uh, well, look, thank you very much again, Wang Feng in Taorong in Beijing, uh, Li Chung and Jonathan Pollock uh, in Washington joining me here uh, at the Brooklyn studio. Really appreciate your introduction to this very challenging agenda that the People's Republic of China's new leaders have as they look forward.